to MMA, and I'm delighted to say we've got Will Flory with us ahead of his fight in July in Rome in Bellator, which is obviously the big step up. Uh, you've um, fought, you've got a perfect 4-0 record at the moment, but Bellator is a step up from where you've been fighting so far. Yeah, slightly. Like, look, I fought with the FC down in South Africa and with Brave and Jordan. They were both pretty big shows, the FC trying to model their production on the UFC, so... You know, they're a big outfit production-wise. They probably don't have the same publicity or the same kind of scope and reach as Bellator would. But yeah, look, it's definitely a step up. It's a step up pay-wise, it's a step up promotion-wise. But look, it's just a fight at the end of the day. How does this happen? How do you go from fighting on <coughs> those competing promotions to get to... Because I think the hierarchy really is UFC at the top and then Bellator is the second biggest. Yeah, they're definitely number two, all right. Yeah. Um, Look, it's kind of, there's no set route to get anywhere in this sport. A lot of it is being extremely kind of popular to begin with. That's a massive help in your career. It's going to mean that you don't have to be anywhere near as skillful. Um, <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> but like, it is, it's the case, like, you know, it's celebrity v skill factor. Yeah, but it must and be a pain in the hole for a fighter. Oh, yeah, like, it can be incredibly disheartening when you see a guy who's nowhere near the skill level that you have getting opportunities ahead of you just because he's got a celebrity profile. But that's the nature of the game, and this is a promotion-based business, so become famous, <laughs> you know? When does that penny drop at you? What stage in your career, like how soon, how recently is it that you're going, okay, I've got to change this now, it's not going to be just good enough to be a dedicated profession and be a fighter, I, I need to be a showman. When you've realised that you're a pretty good fighter and that you're not getting the fights and you're not getting paid as much as guys who don't have as anywhere near the skill level you have. Yeah. Um, it hits home pretty quickly at that point in time. Like so, in the last eighteen months, you've kind of had a change. Is it is it that recent? Is it? Uh, I think it's something you're probably like. It's gotten, it's changed even since I've been fighting. Um, but it's, it's become a bit more apparent, I suppose, because of the fact that I consider myself very good. I'm undefeated at both pro and amateur. I've put on impressive performances ever I've went, um, and I'm delighted to get this opportunity. It's a huge opportunity. But it wasn't like it just came to me. Yeah. I had to you really to work go. For it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Big time. What kind of things are you doing to get that opportunity then, other than working on your game, other than being an excellent fighter? What are you doing outside of the octagon? Look, you're trying to promote yourself on social media as much as possible, but like, I've tried to kind of, you know, I don't really do anything promotionally that obscure. Like, I just, I'm me and I'm proud of who I am and I just promote myself as Will Flurry. Like, um, I think I don't really have that big a platform to put myself out there yet. Things like this hopefully will help, but like, it's pretty much just be yourself. Like, from my point of view, I just be me and I let that do the work. Um, and I think I'm a pretty impressive person and I think I'm like somebody people would buy into if they knew what I was. But look, you, you see guys doing all sorts of mad shit. Like, and it's... Yeah. It has to be authentic. Well, it, there's two ways, right? You can. You don't have to be, though. Look, there's loads of guys who aren't, and they seem to get a big enough following, and, you know, it does seem to work for certain people, but I choose to be, I suppose. Yeah, well, that's fair enough. Let's, let's do a bit of um, digging then. So it's late in the traditional narrative for somebody who's 4 0 to be getting their step up. You're 29. I guess that's yeah, the yeah. point I'm making here. Yeah, yeah. Is that you're, you're not somebody who at 16 got into this and you're not a 21 year old, you know. Um, so why so late getting into the game? What happened? So I was 21 when I started sport and I played rugby for about 12 years beforehand. Um, I broke my foot in a sevens game in New York and when I came back I was told the best thing I could do was boxing footwork I went down to like I worked with a certain physio and he had a boxing gym um, and he told me the best thing I could do was boxing footwork but it was and the arches of my foot healed up properly and then they had a cage in the gym as well where was this? that was the MMA clinic in Cork in Cork okay yeah and um, what were you doing what was your day job at that point what was your what was I was the... a student at that point I'd gone back so I had lived like, I'd done two years in the course international development, and then I went to New York on a J1 that summer, and I got offered a job by a guy to be a quantity surveyor uh, after I'd broken the foot, and I went back to do surveying then as a course because it seemed like a pretty stable career. Um, Just as uh, the peak of the boom there and then? Uh, that would have been 2010, no, so things were already on the downturn okay, in right, Ireland, yeah. but New York, like, he would offer me a job in America, so I'd okay, grand, yeah, I'd yeah. go there. Um, then I went back, started, you know, had broken the foot by the time I even got back and before I'd even started college before that. And then um, pretty much, yeah, like got obsessed with MMA at that point, like 
did a little bit of the boxing footwork stuff, realized like, oh, this is kind of a technique based thing more than anything. Um, and just always felt like, look, if, I, if it's a resilience based exercise, I'll be extremely good at this. And fighting is the type of thing that's pretty much relies on being a fairly strong character and fairly yeah. kind of confident in your own ability to overcome things. And so you're 22, 23 getting into the sport properly and kind of finding mm. that you have a, a, a love for it. 21, pretty much. Right. Um, yeah, like once I was in, I was in deep fairly quickly. I was still playing the odd bit of rugby um, because I was getting a few quid to play games. So you were club must have playing decent level of rugby? Um, decent, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like pff, I played like underage with Con and Clan William and a couple of other teams. Um, and then Clan William were throwing me a few quid to play games the odd time, but like I wasn't on the verge of professionalism Crunch, or anything. Yeah, yeah. Like, so, you know. so you're doing QS and you get in deep into MMA. Uh, do you keep studying at that stage or are you like? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I finished out the degree. All right, so um, and the offer is still there to go to the stage and you're like weighing that up? Um, I had a girlfriend at the time uh, who I'd been going out with for about five or six years at that stage. And she had applied for the visa as well and didn't get it. No, sorry, she hadn't fully applied. But basically, I thought I might be able to get her in on a sponsorship program as well. It didn't work out that way. So we both decided to go to London because we could both get work over there. Uh, so I moved to London with her. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we all know how the story ends, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. So you didn't go back to New York. And did you practice as a QS? Like, so is yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I went over and I worked there for about a year and a half um, as a quantity surveyor. And I was training full time in London Shoot Fighters. Well, I say training full time. I was training six days a week yeah. at London Shoot Fighters. So I was traveling about three hours on the tube every day. It was a mad life. Like, it was just constant. Like, I was sleeping about five hours a night. But I got a great buzz out of doing it as well in a weird way. Um, and of all, like, at that point, even before I'd finished college, I was like, look, eventually I'm going to be at the level where I can make a career out of this. Like, so you're still pretty young, though, like at that stage, like 23, 24, kind of... I was 25 when I finished the degree. Um, so, yeah, I was, but it was like, I had a lot of pullouts. I had a lot of guys who just didn't show up to fights. And at at like, amateur level at that stage, still? Yeah, even yeah. then, yeah. Um, How many amateur fights did you have? Seven overall, but that was over the space of, what, four years? Right. So... It's not many, like really, like considering how long I was doing it. Yeah. Um, is that normal? Is that is it notoriously hard to get fights at amateur level? Not necessarily. It kind of depends who you are. Um, it seems better these days. It seems like there is more guys involved, and there is a better attitude towards it. When I was fighting amateur, it was the biggest deal in your life. As in, that amateur fight meant everything to you. Like you know, yeah. if you lost this thing, you were gutted for six months. Like, and there was guys who lived and died on these results, but. These days, they seem to have a much more healthy attitude towards it, where it's they'll fight, you know, five, six times a year, and it's win or learn. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And they're like, it's a better attitude overall. It really totally, is. Yeah, because like, I mean, yeah. everybody's going to lose at some point. Really. And yeah, you're going to get your experience. Anyway. And the idea of amateurs is to get your experience at the yeah. end of the day. So, yeah, it's a much healthier attitude towards it now. What kind of a fighter are you at that point? Like, who who do you model yourself on? What are your skill sets? Are you like? I played rugby, so I was a half-decent wrestler, and I was just a pretty strong guy. So a lot of the time, I was just out kind of matched. Like, I was out wrestling guys and out powering them and just grinding on guys a lot. Like, um, we had a coach come in from the States, Jake Hecht, who uh, taught us, like, legitimate wrestling skills. Like, we were learning proper wrestling. and American proper, NCAA wrestling, that kind of stuff. The one yeah, the and even, like, cage wrestling. He got into the UFC after he came to Cork. Um, so we had the first Irish guy, well, no, first Irish-based guy in the UFC um, was Jake. And, uh, yeah, he kind of put us technically a step ahead of most of the Irish teams at that point in time. Like, So I'm just trying to work out what life is like for 26, 27-year-old who's, who's kind of getting to the point where you want to turn professional and you've decided that, you know, I have my degree. I have, like, at some point I'll be able to go back and be a quantity surveyor if I don't make... 100 million quid from yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. MMA. Like, so you've done, you've ticked all the boxes. Like, at that point, is there a freedom then to go? I had saved a little bit of money at that stage um, because it was always the end goal. Like, it was always what I wanted to do. Um, Did anybody try and stop you and say, what mm, the hell are you doing? Not, like, not in those words, but, you know, people are going to go, like, look, you know. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> you know, is this the best career choice long-term, like, um, and you sort of, you listen to those people to a degree, but then 
I've kind of always backed myself in those situations. And look, I, I'm beaten, like, or I've been challenged by guys who've made a career in the sport and are making a very healthy living out of it. And I feel like I'm far more skilled than a lot of guys who can make a very good living out of the sport. So I've always said, why can't I? Yeah. Um, That's the answer to those questions from, from your perspective. It's yeah, like, yeah. you know, you need a career path here. At some point, you want to settle down. You might want to have. And, you know, if you're. <laughs> I don't know, I just don't see the, like, I didn't enjoy being a surveyor at all. I didn't like that lifestyle. I, it repulsed me in loads of ways. And I always just felt like I can make this a new lifestyle. And at some point, I'm going to be able to get to the point where I can have enough of, you know, enough money to basically be able to go, no, look, I'm going to do what I choose to do with my life. And that's the point I'm working to get to, like, the point where I don't have to do anything I don't really, really want to. Like, yeah. um, and I love martial arts. I love, you know, being involved in the martial arts scene and everything. Like, Can you achieve that through MMA? Like, it's so, yeah, like say I'm, when you finish fighting, you know, if, like, you'll still have to work, probably, more than likely. I don't think so. No. <laughs> I think I'm pretty damn good. Like, right, okay. Um, and look, the potential, there is no set career path in this, like, as in the potential... There's no can, exit plan either then, though. Like, you don't see yourself opening gyms or, like, do... Yeah, like, I could in future. You know, and that's something I think I'd really like to do eventually. But I like right now I'm at that kind of price riding stage where that's not my mentality. I'm not thinking of like, oh, I want to bring up the next generation. I'm thinking I am this generation. I want to make the most out of this point in time. Yeah. You know, I have another six, seven years of going hard at it. Like, and within that, I feel like I can do extremely well out of the sport. So. It seems that you're not trying to prove people wrong, that there wasn't too many people saying you shouldn't pursue this. You're actually trying to look at the people who have made it and who you feel you're better than, which is kind of a positive outlook, I dare say, on, on this whole thing. Because ultimately, if you're looking to prove people wrong, you're kind of, your emotions are going to get the better of you. You're going to follow a path for no particular reason. Whereas this seems like a, an outlining of a load of very, very positive reasons to pursue this thing. Yeah, pretty much. You know, it was a kind of, like, nobody said, don't do this you're an idiot or, you know, nobody stopped me as such. But, like, people definitely leaned on me and said, look, is it the smartest thing you can do? And I've always felt like, yeah, of course it is. It mm. definitely is, like, you know. Yeah. Um, there are times where I kind of see why people are so concerned in other ways, but, you know, I've made a damn good go of it so far, I feel like, you know. The concerns will be more to do with health reasons rather than you not making it. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah, that? yeah. That's it. So, like, look, there's no question over having a good career, like, making it as a fighter as such. Um, but it's more how are you afterwards and, you know, the long-term effect of that. And is it going to be something where you're not who you could have been when you were 55, 60, like... Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. <laughs> Cause, uh, I saw you watching the clip of the elbows. Yeah, you, you were coming in, I was like, oh, caught rapping. But, uh, so well, we may as well show everybody what we're talking about. So this is in South Africa, right? Yeah. Uh, it's EFC, is that what it's called? Yeah, the Extreme Fighting Championship. The Extreme Fighting Championship. So have a look at this. This, um, this is a controversial end to your... Uh, it's up there on the big screen for us. Talk us through, that's you on the bottom receiving these illegal... Oh, yeah, all, yeah, yeah, like one literally, yeah. Well, um, there's maybe one that kind of clips the ear, which is technically legal, but yeah, there's they're all like it's pretty much a textbook. This is what you can't do. It's the worst rule break. Like, it's a silly rule, but there's uh, twelve to six elbows. They're illegal as well. So if you're elbowing directly down, yeah, that's illegal. So it's an illegal elbow to an illegal area. So um, you can't elbow straight down. Yeah, technically, like it's if you have to be kind of sideways or at an angle. Yeah, it's supposed to have an angle on it. Now it's a silly, silly rule, but it is a rule still. Like they haven't got rid of that. Yeah. Um, so anything to the back of the head as well is completely like that's and so highly illegal. If it happens once, you're supposed to get disqualified straight away, or is it like you a warning? probably get a warning? Um, but he didn't, um, and then he continued and continued and continued for a long time. And then the referee grabs him and he continues the elbow afterwards as well. Um, but look, I got it. Like, I was conscious at the end of this. I walk back to my corner. I have like this kind of strange feeling of like something really significant has just happened because um, I couldn't... I thought I was lifting him and that I'd like lifted him and spiked him on his own head. So I thought I might have been the one who was in trouble when I walked back over to my corner because I'm literally I come to as I'm being like sent back, 
And um, I walk over to my corner and I'm, it's like I'm straight back. I'm like, okay, what just happened there? Yeah. And they were like, just get your breath. Just, you don't worry about anything right now. You just get your breath, it's all good. Um, and I'm looking over at him and I'm seeing him getting a good like, long talking to. And I'm putting it together. And I feel a little bit like, hmm, balance isn't great right now. And a little bit of a swirl in my vision. But other than that, like, cardio-wise, I felt fine. And I was like, wait, I was dominating this. And I had, like, I'd taken him down, I'd mounted him, and the fight was going my way pretty well before that. Um, so my whole thing was to get it going again. Like, I was like, he's exhausted. I could see it. I, like, he was hunched down, and he was, like, really gasping for air. So <laughs> I walked back over, and I'm kind of, like, waving... Like, being like, don't give him too much time because I don't want him to, like, yeah. fully recover. Um, but the referee had stopped the fight there, had he? No. So it, w- it went on for he a did a timeout? Yeah. Okay. And uh, he was warning him at the time. And it was going to restart. And we actually got put back in position to restart that fight. So it felt as if it was going to restart for about five or six minutes. Then Graham, the promoter with the UFC, called in because this was, like, a closed house fight, so there wasn't a full crowd at okay. it. It was part of the reality show. And um, he had called it like, or he basically had a lot more sway in that situation than he would have had had it been a normal fight. Yeah. And um, he cancelled it. He basically told the doctor to go in and do a balance test on me and to like rule it out. Yeah. Um, so the doctor came in, where are you? What day is it? Whatever. I was extremely cog- I can still remember all of this perfectly. Like, um, and as soon as I'm like, besides the little 10 second window of getting elbowed, that whole day, everything beforehand, everything afterwards, is all there. And even the next few days felt great. It's very strange. Head trauma is a real weird thing because you can't quantify it. I've seen guys get one, you know, half decent hit, and they're in a loop, memory-wise, for an hour. Yeah. I was straight back to where I was and fully cognizant and fully aware. And you know, afterwards there was an argument of like, oh, where they landed and blah blah. I was like, sure, there's 15 cameras here and there's a production crew. Like, we can just look at the fucking footage. To see if he's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt like I was being the most logical person in the whole situation, but... This was when you were talking about maybe disqualifying him, because ultimately this is how you're... So just to explain what EFC is, uh, that was a reality TV series that if you win, you end up getting catapulted kind of up the rankings globally, effectively. Well, yeah, so the EFC are a promotion, but they had, like, this was their first time doing a reality series based off of, like, The Ultimate Fighter, which is UFC reality series. Yeah. Um, And the idea was, it was a pretty sweet deal. If I went down there and I won it, you get like the winner's contract, which was good money to um, fight the champion of their middleweight division over there, which is this guy, Drickus Duplessis, who's now a three weight, or he's a three division world champion. So he's the EFC middleweight and welterweight world champion. And he's the KSW, who'd be one of the other bigger organizations, welterweight champion. So he'd be a good scalp if you could get your hands on him and beat him you'd be seriously catapulted into it. So you're doing really well in the promotion and in the uh, reality TV series when this fight happens and you take 15 elbows, 11 directly to the back of the head and instead of this guy being disqualified... Yeah, it was crazy how they dealt with it. Um, I think a lot of it was financial. They basically didn't want to have to prolong the show. So for anything other than me being ruled out because they had to say, oh, look, you're concussed and you can't fight again quickly. So they were giving me like 14 days before I could fight again. Yeah. Um, which which is arbitrary. Days, like, and that would have been 14 days paying the crew of, yeah, to before stay you around. could fight. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And 14 days of like keeping everyone down there yeah. and they already had flights booked back and all this sort of thing. So the easiest option and the option they went for was to say, oh, okay, it's a no contest, so it's not a disqualification because yeah. if they disqualified him, they couldn't let him through to the next round. Yeah. But they said no contest, and he goes through to the next round based on the fact that you can't compete again. Okay. Um, I was pretty upset over that, obviously, and uh, made a lot of very logical reasons as to why, like, or you know, made a few quite valid arguments. But sure, doesn't change the reality at the end of the day. What was their response to those arguments? Tough look. Really? Yeah, basically. It's not interested. Uh, um, no, and that's how it did. Like. You know, if you're dealing with promoters or if you're dealing with any situation like that, it's the leverage you have on those people. And at that point in time, I have very little leverage. You know, I have the injustice. I have the, this is wrong. That's great. It's wrong. That's the look. 
Just on the head trauma thing, you said head trauma is a weird thing there. It Was that unique to you, do you think? I'm not sure how many people you've spoken to about this, the fact that you remember most of what happened around that. Yeah, it does seem to be different. Anybody else I know that's ever been in any sort of a similar situation. And even, like, I look at that footage. When I actually saw the video, I was shocked. Like, yeah. I couldn't believe it was that bad. Like, um, you know, we both got brought to the hospital that evening because I'd elbowed him on the top of the head a couple of times with very similar elbows so that's why I don't make the 12-6 argument you know I'd, it's bollocks to be honest mm. but uh, I'd caught him with a few and he had a couple of little cuts up the top of his head and we were being brought in and he was a lot more hazy about what had happened right, than I right. was and I felt completely like and even they brought me in they were doing like yeah, I did a CT scan that night which is kind of a pointless exercise really to be honest um, but pretty much everything felt very normal and seemed very normal and then I see it and I'm like holy crap that's what happened Like, <laughs> how, how does that make you feel having that sort of trait with your head because they often say when it comes to boxing the, the boxers with the best chin are almost more susceptible to having problems down the road because they don't feel it at the time and they can stand up for longer and take more hits yeah um, <laughs> again like I'm in my what late 20s now I'm doing everything possible to try and ensure that I'm still me in my late 60s, but, you know, it's an accepted, like, I'm aware of the risk. I've been brought in, I've been shown, I've researched the risk as much as possible. Have you? So you've, you've read the... Yeah, even, like... CTE stuff and all that. Too. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, it's grim reading, but, like... You made yourself do it, because I'd say a lot of people decide actively that I'm not going to find out about this, I don't want to know about it. I think right now in the sport, there's a culture of you have to know. If you're going to get involved in this, you should know. And even, we were all brought in last year and given kind of a concussion conference. In the Royal College of Surgeons? Yeah, yeah. Um, which I thought was a great idea. And look, it's not everything. It's not every little detail you should have going into any, uh, deciding to have a career in this. But it's definitely a start. And yeah. it's an awareness. And it's making people more aware. And that was designed to kind of shock people. It was designed to make you feel like, whoa, God, there are going to be consequences here. And that's a great thing. I think we should be put in that position where it's like you're aware if you choose this as a career, there's possibly some serious consequences from yeah, it. Yeah, I think, um, look, so we've covered the concussion story for the last decade. Yeah, really. I've heard a lot of your stuff Cri on it. Like, like, injury, like the only thing I've, I see is like, it's still very, very early in the research stages. Like, you know, and why some people seem to be able to take ridiculous head trauma for, you know, fairly sustained periods of time and some guys header a ball you know a couple of hundred times through their career and seem to get dementia yeah it's still very poorly understood the whole thing is very poorly understood i've witnessed boxers like who've had styles where they're getting hit in the head hundreds of times every fight they fight 40 50 fights and they seem okay in their 60s and 70s it's a very strange thing and we don't it seems like we don't have a full understanding of it yet. Like, yeah, it's it's hard to tell exactly what the cause and effect and, and those relationships are. The thing that stands out for me in all the stuff that we've done was Chris Nowinski, who was um, professor at Harvard in the WWE, whatever whatever his name was, Doctor Harvard, whatever his character's name was. He's kind of the the lead um, advocate for concussion rights in the states, and he was saying, all we need to do is get to a position where everybody understands what the risks are and inform consent. Okay, that's not all we need to do. But once we get to informed consent, at least... It's a huge part of it, yeah. Like, are you fully aware of what these risks are? Mm. If you are and you sign this up, then off you go. It's the people who are kind of, who have to do this, who, you know, who are trying to escape from whatever their situation is. Like, it seems to me like you have a desire to fight. Yeah, like, exactly, yeah. Like, nobody is forcing me to do this. You could go and, and be miserable as a quantity of air. and made my choice yeah. as that. And... And to be honest, I don't think anybody is forced to fight. Like, most of the guys I know in MMA, they could pursue other things in life. You know, there's very, very few guys who are like, oh, this is your only option in life, especially if you're in Ireland. Maybe elsewhere in the world, it's a slightly different story. Yeah. But it's a choice. And as long as you know the risks, you know, you're an adult. You can make your own choice on it. So what's the career path from here? Let's assume that you, uh, you win in three weeks' time, 14th of July, mm -hmm. in Bellator. What happens next? You keep winning, and you keep winning, and you keep winning, and people start paying more and more attention, and then all of a sudden Will Flurry's a thing, 
and all of a sudden, you know, I'm coming in here and doing a very different interview, and you know, it's not about like, oh, it's a hard luck story or it's a head trauma. It's like, why did you decide to do this? It's a story of like, well, what's next, and where's this belt gonna go? And this is it. Like, it's just, I think every obstacle, like, you have to just embrace facing the next obstacle and the next obstacle and the next obstacle. So right now it's three weeks in Rome. Great. The opponent got changed a week ago. Doesn't matter at all. Some guy's going to show up. Some guy's going to get beat that night. Yeah. It really doesn't matter to me. Does but it? Does the opponent matter in terms of like your standing within Bellator? Like that's you know. So the guy I'm about to fight is five and zero with five knockouts. Um, I think knocking him out would look very good. <laughs> you know. So yeah, it should. But it really doesn't as much as you'd think. Like, it should make more of a difference if you've beaten legit guys. It's more about your ability to draw a crowd and talk about... Yeah. Talk the game. That seems to be the way it's going at the moment. To look good on Instagram. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. And that's what the sport is. A lot of... Like... In a lot of ways. There is a huge... Like, look... There are a massive amount of incredibly skilled athletes out there who will hopefully get to the top of this. But right now, it's... And this is the thing. When you go to the top levels of the UFC, all these guys are legit fighters. What we're seeing, though, in the UK scene and in Ireland at the moment is kind of, well, not necessarily just in Ireland, everywhere in Europe or the world even, at lower level, is kind of this celebrity being pushed above skill level. You know, it's frustrating. I'm sure it is. Um, a couple of quick things. So you're three weeks out. Today is, what, the 20th, and the fight's on the 14th. So 10 days this month and two weeks where are you with regards to the weight? What, what's that process like for you? Yeah, um, so I'd cut a decent amount of weight. Like right now, I'm about 91 kilos and I'll have to weigh 84 on the 13th of July. That's, it's not, that's very easy for me to do, you see. Uh, like I say, very easy. It's uncomfortable. For <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> but it's not, that's not a difficult process. Like I'm not concerned at all about the fact that I'll make the weight. Um, How do you do it? Pretty much, right. So I'll kind of deprive myself of carbohydrates for the kind of seven or eight days before the weigh-in, get rid of all the glycogen and the muscle because that's what holds on to a lot of the water. And I heard Joe Malloy talking to Andy Lee last week and I was really surprised Andy Lee had never done the water loading uh, because it's a very useful tool to get rid of a lot of weight. Um, I'll, that Saturday, say, if I'm weighing in on a Friday, I'll start drinking kind of between eight and 10 litres of water a day to make my body flush more water. The idea is like you produce more vasoprin, I think it is, and you decrease aldosterone, I think. I might be completely wrong on that. But basically the hormones that control your hydration levels are telling your body, get rid of all the water you can because there's a ton coming in every day. Um, so after four or five days of that, you just gradually decrease the water. You do four on your last day. So say if I'm weighing in on the Friday morning, Thursday before 12 o'clock, I'll drink four liters and then zero. So the idea is your body's flush and flush and flush and flush and getting rid of any possible water it can get rid of. And I'm also carbohydrate depleted, so my muscles have no glycogen, so they don't hold on to any water, and everything comes out. And you wait, like, I've done 91 to 84 without even getting in a sauna a few times. Right. Um, now, recently I've had to get in a sauna a few times and do, like, a little bit of heat to get the body to sweat. Yeah. But I've never struggled in any significant way to make the weight or, you know, it's never been a huge issue for me. And so it doesn't distract you from all the other stuff that's going on? It, like, it takes up a lot of your mental energy and I have to diet and I have to be super disciplined about it. And it is like the fight before the fight. You know, I, it takes your focus yeah. and it becomes a thing. It is like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to make the weight, it's going to be something I'll do easily. I'm a professional about it. You know, I follow a plan, I pretty rigidly stick to that. At times, the results of what I've done have varied, as in, like, I've done the same thing, but it might be a slightly different result, which right. always kind of intrigues me a little bit. I'm like, why was that different this time? Yeah. But, yeah, like, the making the weight is kind of a like, fun little thing to do before the fight. It just kind of enforces that, like, oh, you're this disciplined guy who can do this into your brain. Like, Do you have any access to the Institute of Sport and that kind of, the, their dietitians? Is that something you'd be interested in? Is it like... Uh, Cause it, you know, I don't at the moment, but like... And the sport isn't, isn't properly recognised yet, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's that whole controversy, which we won't get into today. But like, you would then have access to some of those dietitians who might be able to help along the way, who have some experience, obviously, with the elite Olympic boxers and that kind of stuff. I don't know if that's of any interest or of any yeah, use. Yeah, it would be great. It would be great to have that. And it would be great to have the country recognised. Like, 
oh, you're a legitimate athlete and this is a sport, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, hopefully it'll come. It's coming, I feel like, day by day. It's yeah. Hard. yeah, I mean, I think, I think the general public actually fully understands that you live your life as a professional athlete. And I, I mean, that's kind of an, an automatic side effect of the McGregor phenomenon, really, is that like, people respect the athleticism of it. And the craft, I think they're beginning to. I hope so. Um, I still see a lot of stuff. Like, and I think in general in the mainstream media, there's kind of like a distrust of what MMA is, if you know what I mean. And there's just this kind of... So I think the scenes of you... That, yeah, it's crazy. Head, and like, like, I hate the fact that a promoter can do that to me. It's wrong. And in a way, it, like, the exact same thing can happen in any combat sport. It's not just exclusive to MMA, this sort of thing. You see boxers all the time who get done in by promoters. I don't know if there's a way to fix it. It's kind of the nature of the beast in a way. Yeah. But that sort of thing isn't indicative of, of an MMA gym, no. which is a, basically a community center more than anything else. Like as in, I think the level of misinformation out there about what MMA is in this country is ridiculous Like to the average person because all of these people calling for MMA to be banned, I'd love for them to just one step into an MMA gym and see what it actually is. You know, it's teenage girls learning jiu-jitsu, learning how to defend themselves. Some 40-year-old guy hitting a bag, trying to get rid of the day's stresses. Like, it's... it's Prize fighters are, like, 5% of the members of an MMA gym. Or less, even, yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah. even less in certain places, like... And it's basically just a big community center of people who are doing something that's not quite a team sport or not quite in anything, but, yeah. like, they're learning, they're progressing, they're kind of getting a bit more confident in general, and it's an extremely positive thing. And even, like... You know, not to get too artsy fartsy about it, but my whole journey in fighting has basically been like, what can you do? You know, how resilient are you? How, you know, it's a journey of becoming a better person or trying to be, you know, but you're painted as a tug a lot of the time. You know, and even like, I've been introduced to people as an MMA fighter and you see their face change and they kind of go, oh, well, is he a tug? Like, oh, you know. Tell them your quantity is surveyor and they'd be like, oh, Yeah, exactly, you're a respectable look, guy, you know, I can have a conversation with you. Yeah. Or a lot of the time, even if I've been talking to somebody for 20 or 30 minutes, and then I mention the fact that I'm an MMA fighter, they kind of go, but you're, you're not a thug, you're not an idiot. Like, what do yeah. you... It's, you know, there's still that perception out there that this isn't really a cerebral sport, which it is. It's an incredibly cerebral thing. Like, as in, to understand jiu-jitsu, to train for years and years and years, and slowly develop that game... It's like becoming a chess master. And I, I, like, there is a cognitive, like, people are somewhat aware of what that is, but there's still so much misinformation out there, you know. Yeah, so you're fighting it one fight at a time and one conversation at a time. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah you know. It takes breaking down those barriers one day at a time, I suppose. Yeah. Well, listen, Will, you've been really good with your time. Uh, best of luck with the, the next couple of weeks with the weight cut, and I presume you're in the midst of sparring, or is that yeah, tapering yeah. off at the minute? Yeah, doing a little bit of all that now, so yeah. now it's a heavy phase. Like. Here in, in Ireland, in Dublin, yeah. and then over to Rome kind of the week before, the week of the fight? I'll go on the Wednesday of the fight week, so fly out Wednesday, fight Saturday, fly back the next Wednesday. And if anybody wants to watch it here, is it on TV? Yeah, it's, um, it's supposed to be. Yeah, I think it's supposed to be on Spike TV, but they show it on a delayed stream, and I'm not sure if it gets on. Okay, so maybe we could look for it somewhere, is that the...? I'd imagine so, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll find it in places. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I think they're planning on doing a TV deal that they get shown here. Okay, cool. Well, listen, best of luck, and uh, congratulations on everything so far. Cheers, thanks, Willie.